But that's something we're pushing ha very, very, very hard on. Because let's be honest, Google is a fucking shit show right now. It's quite scary how bad it is still. Focus more on like what's Follow gonna make the money, basically. biggest money, you know? Yeah, he makes a lot of money staying in bed all day. It's pretty nice, but uh, it's completely fine to do that. You can see all the large size doing that. And I think we have a problem in this industry. And the problem is that 2023 has been rough on people building a website for a living. And Google search results are an actual clusterfuck at the time at which I'm recording this video, and that's putting it mildly. I mean, people are ranking for illegal porn keywords using Google Translate, and others are parasiting the American Heart Association, the website you're supposed to be able to count on if you have the signs of a stroke or a heart attack to rank for gummy CBD keywords through dodgy redirects. So I doubt Google is done with the updates for now because they have to address this mess, and I expect more turbulence coming soon. Still, this puts us in a bit of a difficult situation as the sites builders who are trying to do things in a legit way, try to build an audience and build trust with them in order to monetize, we need to adapt to the world that's shaping in front of us. But as I mentioned in the 2024 prediction episode, chaos is a ladder, and many of us have been able to take advantage of it to grow massively in 2023. For example, Derek from NapLab, who I interviewed last year, almost 3x his traffic and grew by 62% since the interview last October. And Arne and Mauricio, who are Platinum members, managed to 3x the organic US traffic to coffiness.de, despite being a pure affiliate site. And I rarely talk about it, but we more or less doubled the traffic on Atari Hacker last year as well. So now is a good time to do what SEOs do best, which is find the winners of this new Google paradigm, understand what worked for them, and adapt the business model so everyone can grow and thrive. And that's exactly what we're doing in this episode. Now, if you are a member of the Authority Site System, we are also evolving our training free of charge for you. We've completely reshot all the commercial content lessons, created brand new templates, created brand new template guidelines, and even created full page templates that you can directly import into your WordPress site. These templates allow you to get a fully designed roundup review, single review, alternative post, or VS post directly on your site, fully done with all the widgets, perfectly mobile responsive, including all the comparison tables, best CRO, HCU, EEAT, everything's in there. They're also fully customizable to your branding and template, and they're built on the free version of Generate Blocks, which means you don't need to pay anything to use this, and it won't slow down your website. This stuff is exactly what you need to create better content that mimics exactly what's ranking right now in the service, because that's exactly what we use to build these templates, and it's going to be saving you dozens of hours and countless mistakes instead of building it yourself. These new updates come on top of 12 brand new lessons that address many of the Google and AI changes. And for the new year, to try to help you with your new projects, we're running a special offer, but it's running out very soon, so don't miss it out. You can get all the details on authorityhacker.com slash system. Before we get started, I want to say thank you to today's episode sponsor, Search Intelligence, the digital PR agency. We'll tell you a bit more about them a bit later in the episode. But for now, let's get started. Hey everyone, happy new year and welcome to the Authority Hacker podcast. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about what changes in the authority site model in 2024 and the changes we are making inside our business to adapt to the many changes that have come last year and to the changes that are coming this year, most likely. But before we get started, happy new year, Mark. How's it going? It is going great, thanks. And it is indeed 2024 right now. We're definitely not recording this in 2023. I had a, I think, good new year and a, I think a good Christmas. How about you? Uh, I stayed at home. <laughs> I didn't do much. <laughs> it's like, because that's what I always do because I, I hate New Year's Eve. It's probably my the worst night of the year for me. So it's like, uh, so yeah, I don't do New Year's Eve if you want to know about that. I think the most important question we have is, did you buy anyone any Christmas presents this year? Uh, no, I stuck to my tradition. Uh, where I don't buy, pe buy people Christmas presents. I just buy them big gifts when it makes sense. So, for example, my mom just recently got an iPhone from me uh, because that's something that actually is helpful for her. Uh, cost a bunch of money, but it's like this way I buy her something like that. And every couple of years I do that and then I don't buy anything other than that. So um, I have that anti-gift policy for the sake of making gifts, at least. The gift giving and anti-gift person. So I like it. Yeah, I just I buy gifts that people use in their real lives, not like bullshit because for the sake of Christmas and a shitty pair of socks that I'm gonna throw away because it looks ugly anyway. You know, it's like it's I hate. All that, right, that no, idea. no Grinch hat for you this year <laughs> then. <laughs> no. Anyway, that's not what we're talking about. I guess today's gift is the podcast. You know, quite a questionable gift, but let's do let's do our best here. And we're gonna talk about the way the business model of building authority size is evolving in 2024. How are we reacting to 
you know, a lot of the changes that have happened in Google, obviously, like how full content update has affected the industry a lot. Uh, product review update, actually, we had the last one last year. So like now they actually made it part of the core algorithm. So you should not hear about new product, uh, product review updates. They're just part of, of how it works. Uh, there was some spam updates as well, and obviously some core updates. So quite a lot of stuff. A lot of people went down in traffic last year, right? It's like, it's, it wasn't a very positive uh, outcome for people. To be frank though, I looked at a lot of sites and we'll talk about several of these in this episode where, you know, their site, the traffic went back down to where it was like a year ago, something like that. It's not like completely wiped out, etc. Some people got wiped out, like usually like a lot of like less good sites got wiped out a lot more harshly than better sites. Uh, we'll show you some examples of better sites that, that did pretty well this year, so that gives you guys some inspiration. But overall, uh, you know, things are changing, and I would suspect that running into the first half of the year, at least as we said in the prediction podcast, things are going to continue changing because, let's be honest, Google is a fucking shit show right now, and everything that ranks, I mean, a lot of stuff that ranks is pretty crap, and the search results are not satisfactory. So uh, unless Google does something, I think they're going to start facing a user erosion. So my expectation is that there will be pretty strong reactions from Google, uh, probably you know in a month or two, like they need to come back from, from Christmas and New Year as well, uh, and finish these updates. But they've already addressed, for example, that they are looking into Parasite SEO pretty seriously right now. They're kind of like naming it internally and so on. So uh, yeah, it's like stuff's changing. Any any feedback on on these big changes before we jump into niche selection? I mean, I've been looking at Parasite SEO a, a little bit for a video project I've been been working on, and it's it's quite scary how bad it is still, despite the fact that they know all of the uh, bad sites, like they've mentioned them before on on Twitter. Yet there, it, it takes you two minutes to find a competitive term, which Outlook India or you know these sites are are still ranking for. So. It, it's still a problem. Yeah, and that, that's the thing. Like, because it's a problem, I think it's an interesting point. Like, we see that Google's gonna make changes. Like, they can't keep things the way they are. And therefore, there may be tactics that work very well today that you know Google's gonna attempt to patch. The question is like, how quickly are they gonna patch them? And so when we live in that kind of like uncertainty period where Google is likely to make changes, uh, but we don't know exactly in what direction this goes, that's when you kind of like fall back onto like Google guidelines and playing clean, even though some dirty stuff is winning right now. like, And that's because you know that stuff's probably not gonna, not gonna stick eventually because Google search results are so bad right now that, that there, there is a reaction coming. It's just a matter of like when, not if, you know? Um, so I suggest we jump right away into how we're changing niche selection this year, because I think like um, with a lot of these updates, like obviously like higher quality sites have been rewarded. Uh, and so, Really, when you pick a niche, the question is like, are you able to produce that high quality site that's going to be rewarded by, by Google these days, right? And it's like, uh, the way you pick your niche is probably a little bit less opportunistic this year. So it's like, you know, before you were like, focused more on like- what's Follow the money, the basically. Biggest money, you know? Whereas now it's more of a balanced game between obviously money, like that's important and your business, and we're gonna talk about monetization later, but also what can you realistically produce in a credible way in terms of content so that you can be one of these sites that are winning these updates and not losing, right? And so like uh, an example like of an interview we did last year was like NapLab, for example, right? He, he I mean, he went to a, a pretty lucrative niche, but he also built a whole system to be credible in that content creation process. And he's being rewarded big time right now. I mean, maybe we can flash his Ahrefs right now, but he's been killing it for Black Friday and so on. So uh, clearly uh, he's done well. And on top of that, with niche selection, one thing that needs to be considered is that a lot of big publishers are jumping into these affiliate queries, et cetera. Therefore, larger com consumer niches start to be a bit of a no-go now. Like the good news is like, you know, in your TSI system, the way we teach that is by analyzing a lot of SERPs to pick your niche. So it's like, if you analyze that, you essentially, the niches that don't work anymore, they will be highlighted through the research process by showing you a bunch of DR90 sites ranking for all the terms. However, if you niche down, uh, you still can find a lot of like smaller queries that are like much easier to rank for uh, and that you can still realistically do well provided you you produce a credible site basically. So it's a, it's a little bit of a, of a different thing. I would definitely niche down and then uh, at the same time consider what I can produce in a credible way, which is like, which means not just writing words, but 
creating media, creating all of that, et cetera. And we'll talk about other channels as well. I think it's, it's obviously beneficial if you are that expert, right? You know, if you're a doctor or a vet or something that, that opens up the door to to that niche in a, a way that other people just, just can't. But there's also, there's plenty of examples. I mean, even NapLab, like he, he's not a sleep expert, but <laughs> yeah. he's, he's just very, very good at executing reviews and they bought all the products and like really thought through very well, like how to act, what matters uh, in a mattress review and you know how to scientifically calculate lots of cool data points and, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, you, you can win by kind of execution that way if you don't have the in inherent skills, but but you need to get into it, right? I'm I'm sure his his level of sleep expertise is far superior to the to, than the average human these days. Um, but you know, it, it takes a little bit of money as well to to get into that if you don't have the inherent skills. Yeah, he makes a lot of money staying in bed all day. It's pretty nice. But uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's like I mean, and yeah, definitely like SEO is an execution game now. It's like it's not just an idea game. But I think another thing people need to consider is partnerships, right? It's like you're not always a doctor, an expert in something or whatever, and so and that's okay, right? It's like the thing is like now we live in this kind of like multimodal online marketing uh, paradigm where it's like SEO needs to be surrounded with other channels, basically. And we'll talk about that. Um, so you need to be able to create content in video, photos, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's a bigger workload, basically. Like it's, it's, it's more work to create content. And so it's not crazy to consider essentially splitting your business and being two or more people working on this with one side being the expert side where you have someone that knows this stuff. Like we all have someone in our, in our like uh, family or like uh, uh, acquaintances, et cetera, that is very good at something that could become that expert, that face of the website while you take care of more of the marketing side of things. So you can do the SEO, you can do the, the market research, you can do the promotion, the PR, the link building, all that stuff that you want to do. And then, and then I think a lot more people are going to jump into partnerships. Like, but like we are looking into starting new sites and it's like that's one of the strong considerations I have as we are researching niches right now and thinking about it. It's like who can we partner with that will be a strong face for a website where we can have a, a good monetization option basically and that's going to be a lot less heavy on our shoulders, you know? And the key difference here to where you'll, you'll hear a lot of people talk about at the moment or last year um, is, is around ideas of EEAT. It's kind of like the faking it version of it. So, oh, you have a cat website, you get a vet, you, you pay a vet to kind of, you know, review your articles uh, and then slap her face on there, link to her LinkedIn, and that's, you know, your, your authenticity um, done. Well, what we're talking about here is, is really something much deeper and like using, working with people to actually make your content, you know, best in class. Uh, and that's that's something that only like a, an expert in the field can can bring. So, you know, that may be paying them a lot of money. It may be giving away, as Gail said, uh, you equity. know, chunks of your business, equity, profit share. Like you, you need to think in these terms if you want to bring in those those experts. And I think if you're if you're going to be running multiple sites running and running big portfolios, um, you, you need those people at the helm or at least involved at, you know, top level. Um, to be to be successful, I and mean, look at big companies, the Red Ventures of this world, one of the biggest portfolios of portfolio companies of of authority sites. Really, um, at the head of each company is you know an expert or a board of experts in finance or travel or whatever it might might be. You don't need to go that high. Like look at Kevin. So Kevin is purely to like I thought a hacker pro student, but like went quite a bit past it at this point. Like really big. He, uh, he, run, he runs and... EpicGardening.com, which is by far the largest gardening um, brand these days. But what's interesting now is he's he's basically growing other creators. So he's got he's got a big YouTube channel, but he's actually helping like other creators for his brand to grow, basically. So he has Jack and he has like two or three of them, basically. And so it's basically he's also having content partnerships with these people because he just can't handle like they can, his team can produce lots of content, but he can't handle producing everything himself anymore. Uh, so he's kind of like running multiple YouTube channels so that he gets increased reach for his now. Now he has like a seed company and he's selling uh, e-com products, etc. And so like, again, that's partnership as well. Obviously partnership on top, but when you start partnership at the bottom, i.e. you're just getting started, you making an equity deal is not crazy, provided the other side, you know, will be able to do things like, 
review content, hire writers that know this stuff, but also produce videos, produce shorts, maybe have a podcast, like all these things that actually make you like this multimodal uh, content company that tends to do better now than pure SEO games, basically. Yeah, and look, you, you don't have to do all of these things on day one, right? You don't you, you don't need a podcast and a YouTube channel to, to launch your site, but you need to be thinking of those from day one and like how can how can you get into those those other types of platforms uh, with with the team you're building. Yeah, another thing that I think you're gonna have to do when you pick a niche is uh, think about monetization a bit more heavily. It's completely fine to get started with ads and uh, affiliate reviews. Like you can do that if you niche down particularly. Like it's gonna, be, as we said, it's gonna be hard for like mainstream keywords like ranking for, you know, best vacuum cleaner is a little bit difficult these days, for example. But if you really niche down on some niches and you use the process where you actually find lower authority sites ranking, then you can still find some of them. However, there are a lot of other monetization methods that became a lot easier to execute as well. So it kind of like levels things off where like affiliate, affiliate and ads got a little bit harder with obviously all these updates and big publishers pushing in. And then a lot of these other opportunities are maybe slept on a little bit and they are pretty easy to get started. So things like starting your community, for example, there are tools like circle.so that are very powerful and very interesting to start a community. You could start, you know, a ten dollar a month community. You can attach some like small courses to it, etc., and start monetizing your audience through collecting emails with lead magnets and selling that. For example, that is a pretty strong way of monetizing your site. You can have newsletters. You can have free and all paid newsletters. If you do a free newsletter, you can sell sponsorship. A lot more companies are open to sponsorship. I mean, we are sponsoring this podcast now, for example, uh, and this has added like six figures per year in revenue from this podcast. Finally, we're making money from the podcast, 300 plus. Finally. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's like, it actually starts making sense. But like, yeah, sponsorship is something that you can do and you don't necessarily have to have a podcast. A newsletter is an easy way to do that. And and. You know, a lot of companies that don't have affiliate programs will be open to sponsorship, for example. White labeling and e-commerce are also something that uh, you can add to your site. Obviously, Google has loved e-com in the last updates. Uh, a lot of e-com sites have started ranking up when uh, pure content sites have started going down. So sometimes, you know, when you can't beat them, join them. An example of like an e-com site with really low authority I found when I was Googling around was a site that focuses on e-com for fly fishing. Uh, so that talk about niching down. Uh, they are one site. They only have 6,000 traffic, but they rank for very good commercial keywords. So uh, fly fishing hats, fly fishing shirt, fly fishing apparel, they're all like top three in all of these. So like that gives you a good example of like new monetization method that you don't necessarily have to have on day one. I like to still focus on like building up traffic on day one because if you have no traffic, you can't make money. So that's why like ads and affiliate are still a great place to start, even though they're a little bit more difficult now. I, th but I think the, the key thing is to, to think of what comes next. Think of the future exactly. and think of the monetization that you can go into rather than just, you know, throwing a bunch of keywords up there, a bunch of content up there, trying to rank for stuff and then figuring it out. I mean, we made that mistake before, what, eight years ago or something. And with when we started healthambition.com, uh, <laughs> we had half a million visitors, but it was spread amongst uh, so we many different products, categories. We, well, before yeah. then, uh, we, we didn't ha really have the plan to go into that um, initially. And so we didn't ha ha really have that base. Our content wasn't like built for any one thing. And it was just, it was hard. If we'd spent a day just thinking about that and doing a bit of research at the start, it would have, uh, I think, focused us a lot more. That's the thing. When you have a, a, a product in mind that you want to sell, like you, you probably produce different content because it's like if you're just trying to get the most traffic possible, then you just go for like low hanging fruits. But like, you know, you get up for like shitty listicles, et cetera, which are fine for traffic ish these days. Um, but they're not very good at converting these people into buyers. However, when you have a product in mind that you want to sell, you, you're most likely to create content that's targeting lower search volume keywords, but people have some buying intent behind and you're creating your content a bit differently. And that's why when you brainstorm a niche, it's good to think about that because maybe your early content is going to be uh, influenced by that. I think as well, it's like, again, partnerships can also happen in the monetization side of things. So we talked about it in the content side of things or you partner with someone with expertise, but you can also partner with people who already have product companies if you don't want to do that. So for example, uh, we met someone called Jason at DCBKK, that company in that, that conference in Bangkok. And what happened is like, he has a white label, customizable e-commerce 
uh, product that he basically was like, yeah, you guys can just build a site around that. I think it was like, you know, merch, like, you know, you can custom brand it, et cetera. Uh, if you guys want to build a site around that, rank it, drive traffic, it's like, I can fully white label the solution on your site. You have no tech to do. All you have to do is drive traffic to this. So it's like these kind of partnerships, it's like these are the kind of things that people need to pay a bit more attention to, network with people, shake hands, et cetera. And uh, we've done the same thing with marketing pros as well, right? Yeah, like the longer you're in uh, an industry, the the more of these opportunities will will come across your desk. You know, uh, marketing pros is a good example. So, so AH Pro member Doug, um, he built a content agency uh, mostly with a team in South Africa. Then we ended up, uh, then he ended up building a recruitment agency because he got so good at hiring people there. We ended up working with them, liked it, and then offered to do a partnership and invest in in the business. Uh, and you know, every so often a deal like that will come across, or an opportunity like that will 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 come to you. And I think it's just about seizing them when when they do, really. Yeah, and so and so like yeah, people need to like think about that when they pick a niche. Like it's it's a good idea to like survey like who you know, what they do, and maybe how you can partner on the monetization level, not just on the content level. And and I think a lot more SEOs these days are gonna like they won't just be a one man shop anymore. They they might be this kind of like link between a content partner and a monetization partner and then throwing it together by adding lots of traffic and building these things. That's where the big money is going to be made. Basically real business. It makes sense. I, I mean, like mo most SEOs, like what are they good at? They're good at, uh, you know, content, generating traffic, building links, like the, the core things. Identifying opportunities as well through but, market research. But products, building products and stuff, it, it's a completely different skill set. There is some overlap, obviously, like content is content if you're doing courses and things, but it, it makes sense, right? So, uh, work with someone who, who has that side of things down and then just focus on what you're good at. Yeah, I agree. And so and so that's that's definitely like, you know, for the products we're looking at starting this year, it's like that's the kind of stuff that I'm looking at. Like, how do we kind of like, plug these things together so we can be that cog in the middle that just makes everything work and just and then just add lots of value in the end make more value but also do it in a less stressful way where like not everything's on our shoulders like we don't have to take care of the product we don't have to necessarily be the face of the brand we don't have to do all of that we can just focus on what we're good at which is driving traffic and converting it to the offer uh, which we have, you know, good expertise at that most people don't have basically. One thing that I would recommend that you guys do for monetization is actually something similar to what I do for content as well is to sign up to literally every single email list in your niche and apply a custom uh, Gmail label for it. So I have like different labels in my Gmail and it's like it bypasses the inbox so my inbox is not full of marketing emails. But what I do is like once a month, I go through that label where I see all the emails from everyone in that niche and I see how they monetize because email list is usually like converting people and making money from them. And that helps me see who you could partner with, what kind of products they're selling. And then essentially it helps me direct my monetization thinking slash research. So it's like, I highly recommend that you do that. Did you know that half of the audience is not subscribed to our channel? If you're still here, obviously you like the content we produce. So I'd like to ask you a quick favor that I think will serve you well. Please subscribe and activate the notifications on whatever channel you're consuming this content on. This helps us a lot in terms of getting better guests and better sponsors that help us generate more revenue that in turn we can pull back into this podcast to make it even better. We have a ton of really exciting episodes that are coming up with really, really cool interviews and I guarantee you won't be disappointed. So do we have a deal? Hit the subscribe button and we'll do everything we can to make this podcast the best one in the industry. All right, let's talk about search intent now because I think the game really has changed here quite a lot. There was this kind of meta where people would, I, I wanna say copy, but you know, take the best parts of, of the articles which were ranking one, two, and three and then try and make a, a slightly better version of it. Uh, and then, you know, that was their content strategy, essentially, um, regurgitating or repeating what was was ranking. And there are many tools out there, like Surfer SEO, that sort of popularized this, this um, I guess you could call it data-driven approach to copying content, but uh, that, yeah. th that, it, that was the kind of strategy. And it worked, because Google would reward you for, for doing this. And then you ended up with page one of Google had 10 article, articles which were very, very, very similar. And no one was really taking any risks or trying to do anything outside the box. And I think helpful content updates and subsequent updates after that really shook things up there. And that was one thing we, we mentioned in our predictions podcast the previous year was about, you know, ch th there'd be more types of content on, on the first page of Google. So I think 
one different thing we're gonna do with our content this year is have that, how can we add a ton of value to this and almost like build a bit of a moat around our, our content. One problem with this is that it's very expensive to do, right? So unless you're targeting the super high competition keywords, like how, how are you gonna, you know, in the case of NapLab, like how are you gonna buy 50 mattresses and store them in a warehouse and, and do all that stuff? That works only when you're repeating the same format and using the same data in multiple posts. So one approach we're, we've started taking already, but we're really doubling down on it this year, is the idea of content templates. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one thing that uh, kind of like the talk with Brandon like got me to think about. It's like he, you know, when I interviewed him, he was like, he basically threw away all the rules of SEO. He's like, nah, I'm just making my templates and we just scale that up. And I mean, go and put exploding topics in Ahrefs right now. You'll see they're doing just fine. Um, and it's like, yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of the, the recent updates have been essentially punishing people who strictly follow, you know, the outline you get in your favorite on-page tool, whichever that is, basically, and kind of like rewarding pieces that are a little bit different. Like they, they, Google is less afraid to put a bit of diversity on the first page of Google, which I'm happy about personally. I mean, it sucks for the sites that lost traffic, but like as an approach, it's much nicer to have this than to have 10 times the same piece of content on page one of Google, right? It's just it's just more interesting as a user, even though Google is a shit show right now, we know that, don't worry. Uh, but it's like, uh, you can see they're moving a little bit away from that, they understand the limitation of that approach. Our, our way of doing this now is basically kind of like, it's kind of a mix between skyscraper and templates, right? Which is like, you take like a repeatable pattern of keywords. So for example, I give you a bad example of a keyword because I don't want to spoil good keywords. Um, but like best multivitamin, right? It's like, if you check best multivitamin, there's like best multivitamin for women, for women over 30, for women over 40, so women over 50, for men, for men over 30, for men over 40, so men over 50, etc. So these keywords are all high search volume, high intent keywords. And reviewing a multivitamin can be done in, in a bit more of a customized way than your classical, than your classic roundup review. You can come up with custom selection. So for example, when I Google that keyword, I saw that people have comparison tables with each type of vitamin against each product. So you can see like what concentration of vitamin is in each one, et cetera. And so that's what they've done. Like they've built custom templates for that product category, best multivitamin. And they've, they've taken a unique take on that that wasn't on the sub, added some extra value and eventually made this a repeatable template that they can use on like, there's probably like a hundred keywords you can write for best multivitamin, for example. And and just, just throwing it out there, but if you really want to step things up, then, you know, you could almost do something like take all the top vitamins and send them to a lab to get them analyzed, right? It might cost you a few thousand dollars to do that. But if you're, and that's probably not worthwhile if you're writing it for, if you're using that for one article, but if you're using it for a hundred articles, the cost yeah, of awesome, doing yeah. something like that is split among a hundred hundred different articles. So the math starts to make sense or it can make sense in some cases. Yeah, so like the keyword research process is different, right? It's like you're looking for these repeatable patterns of keywords where you can invest lots of resources and lots of time. So for example, now we're, in, we're involving like UX designers and we'll yeah. talk about UX after that to make prototype pages and custom widgets and everything like that. There is custom development going into these pages, et cetera, so that they serve the intent better and they just feel nicer to use and they feel like they added value, i.e. real skyscraper, but repeated a hundred times because there are like a lot of similar keywords that we can do this for. And so that's kind of, that's what the way Steve Toss does a lot of SEO as well. Like if you, if you look at, if you talk to Steve Toss, he'll tell you like, he's just, when he picks a new client, he's just looking for one template that he can replicate many times and just scale that, the shit out of this. Very, very similar approach. And that allows us to escape search intent and do something that actually Google rewards quite well. We've done quite well with that recently. Uh, and, and that's kind of like a new paradigm. So like, if you're just relying on your, you know, on-page tool to come up with what to put on your page, you're probably gonna fall behind as more and more people adopt this, this approach and you're gonna have to one-up it once again and finally Google's rewarding that a little bit more. It's also easier for sort of like defensive SEO. So once you have uh, written the entire cluster, you have your hundred articles out there, it's not like you just forget that and like find new keywords, find new keywords. You can monitor the entire thing. And you know, if you're fighting a few battles here and there for the more competitive ones, you're you're learning what works and you can apply the same thing to all 100 templates. You can do A-B testing. Exactly, well. yeah, because you have the volume there. Yeah, so we, we do that. Like, I mean, if you can check, even Atari Hacker, you'll see the approach being uh, being uh, being used. For example, if you look at our SEO here, uh, we, we are able to like, 
essentially take five pages, change the template a little bit against five other pages. We can see time on page, we can see bounce rate, we can see uh, impressions on GSC, we can see all of that. Uh, a lot of these pages, because they're targeting long tail keywords, they rank pretty high. So therefore, like the, the results allow us to, to really have meaningful results. Uh, and that's also like a talk that Nick Drew, one of the H Pro students as well, gave in DCBKK about A-B testing. And he does the same thing on a really big coupon site called withrift.com. Uh, and, and it's the same approach as well. He basically has the same page template for him. It's like very large scale, like 100,000 times, a million times, whatever, like really lot, lots of pages. And he does these A-B testing through templates. And so scaling your content through templates will allow you to scale high quality content, add value, and still, it will make sense economically because you're repeating the same template many times. And so that's that's kind of like the big change we're doing this year. Probably there will be some training coming about this. Like we're kind of like refining some stuff still, but we're gonna probably gonna, gonna release some training around this approach uh, this year, actually. And I, you, you think of like the, the very top sites on the internet, you know, like Expedia and Booking.com, Airbnb, like they, they have these templates and that's that's basically how they do SEO. Uh, so by having these, you're, you're kind of giving yourself the scale to be able to do that. But the funny part is this kind of goes a little bit against topical authority, because when you scale with templates, you essentially miss some keywords, like because like, you know, some long tail related queries where you don't have the template for you tend to not produce. Right. So like, you know, again, if you're reviewing multivitamins, maybe there's a, I saw a keyword, which is like, where's the best time to take the multivitamin during the day, you know? Like if you're just scaling this template, best multivitamin, and you have like this super well-produced page, et cetera, you might not produce like what's time, what time, when is the best time to take multivitamin? And, and you're missing on that. But honestly, we prefer the approach of building better pages than, than just scaling up on every keyword. I, you know? I think you're going to be rewarded more if you have best in class pages, a hundred best yeah. in class pages reviewing the, the multivitamins without sort of doing, let's say any info content around them at all. Um, if, if yours are, are the best, you, you'll win. Probably what I would do to, to tackle this is I would actually have like an FAQ item on these pages. Like, you know, at the FAQ at the end, I'd be like, what's the best time to take multivitamin? So like my site's covering the topic without necessarily having to produce a full page on this. Uh, that's, that's the way I would address it and it's probably gonna be fine. Uh, the thing that goes hand in hand with that is UX design. And I think we have a problem in this industry. And the problem is that the default niche site aesthetic does not cut it anymore for the user. They tend to look pretty bad on mobile, especially if they're heavily loaded with ads, for example. Like if you have like default gen WordPress and you have like that sticky video on top, the sticky thing at the bottom with Mediavine and the, the, ref, left, the rest of your content is like taking only half the screen and it's hard to read, the font size is not correct, it's too big to, or like there's not enough padding on the size or something like this. You're like, scrolling down is, and it stops scrolling when you get to a video or something on the eye, it's super annoying. It scrolls right? horizontally yeah. because some elements are larger than the main container as well, like these kind of things. Like we have a problem here, like people don't pay enough attention to how using their site feels, especially on mobile. Google has made, has finally finished making their index mobile first on October 31st, 2023, right? Which just so happens to be about the same time when authority hackers traffic um, for the first time became the majority mobile. So we're, we're somewhat unique in that I think a lot of people are working on their websites at home, on the laptops, on the desktops. And so we've, we've always had more desktop traffic um, than the average site. For most other sites have been de uh, mobile, majority of traffic mobile for years and years now. Uh, so if we're finally there, then you know, we have to finally start thinking about mobile mobile first as well. So everybody else should already be ahead of us, but they're not. But I think it's not just mobile, right? Mobile is a big part of it, a really big part of it. I think most sites look like shit on mobile. People build sites on their stuff, don't think about mobile. It's a huge, huge, huge mistake. And there's a lot that can be done. I mean, we'll do, we're working on a bit of a redesign right now and you, you see how much work is being put. We'll show you guys when it's done. Um, but I think also like when I talk to, to our editorial team, I, I tell them to forget the idea of blog posts. Like in my opinion, blog posts are, are done. Nobody reads blogs anymore. It's not a thing. Yeah, you need to build web pages instead, like pages that are well-designed and that never at any point where I have a screen on my, on my page, I only see text and headlines. Like you just, to, just to be clear here, we're not talking about the WordPress difference between a post and a page. That's that's I'm irrelevant. Blog posts. It's it's yeah. it's the experience of going through a page or a post or anything on 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 the site and all the elements that that go on with that. So not just the words. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like a web page, you know, it's like you imagine something that's well designed with a custom experience when you go through, etc. And, you know, it's using reusable formatting elements like toggles, galleries, tabs, uh, highlight box, editors, comments, interactive graphs, uh, proper styled headlines, ways to jump around the page, not just a shitty table of content that you have on top of your of your article, like maybe it sticks at the bottom or things like like lots of like tool tips as well. Uh, basically, you need to have you need to hide a lot of your content as well. So let me give you an example of that, right? I Google best credit cards, one of the most competitive affiliate keyword, and we opened that page on Forbes.com, and you will see that they are actually, they have lots of content on the page, but then they're designing it like a web page. As I said, when you scroll down, you rarely see just text, or at least for the first half of the page. What they do, first of all, is like the boring SEO content is all thrown down at the bottom of the page. Uh, and so you, you'll find all of that there, but the first half of the page is focused on conversion and engagement. So for example, they have this section why you can trust Forbes adv Advisor. That whole section that people try to highlight very much for the E80, et etc. they hide this behind a toggle. Like you click on it and then it expands and then you can see that. Then they have a summary of the page that you can expand as well. But again, it's like hidden behind a toggle. Then after that, they have a tab system that allows you to filter the credit cards based on what you're looking for. Are you looking for travel or airlines uh, credit cards? Are you looking for cashback credit cards, etc.? You can click on this and it's going to filter the widget below that includes a lot of content, but also is hidden. So you actually get the highlight of the product with like pros and cons, annual fee, APR, credit score, etc. And when you mouse over a bunch of elements, it will give you tool tips, so that content is hidden. And then they have three sections per product, why we picked it, which is their content on like why they think it's a good credit card, pros and cons, that's also a toggle, card details with like all the specs, also a toggle, so that you can scroll through the products really, really fast. And when you like a product, you can expand the content, but it's not in your face and it's not a very long page to scroll. They, they managed to build a, a massive page with lots of content. However, the way they format it, also makes it very easy to browse and get to the content you want because they kind of like collapse a lot of stuff behind hidden elements, tool tips, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's the difference between the large sites and the niche sites where everything is just like a, a giant 5,000 word to scroll page. And it's like you, you doom scroll through walls of text and people just don't engage with the content. And so that's what we're trying to emulate on our sites. I know this is a pain in the ass to do, right? But again, going back to what we said templates. before about templates, if it's the same for 100 articles, then suddenly like it becomes much more worthwhile, right? But if you have to configure each one unique for every every individual article, then yeah, it is very, very time consuming. But it's necessary if you want to rank at, you know, the, the level of Forbes and best credit cards and, you know, the super competitive type. type. Uh, I mean, it's going to be hard to rank for best credit card for most people. How yeah, OK, right? like, you know, they, <laughs> you, you need that level of authority at the moment to, to, to do that. But even if you have that, you know, it's, it still takes this level of content to do it as well. But one thing is like, you know, a lot of people are quick at pointing at these large sites and be like, oh, it's all backlinks and like that's why they're ranking and Google is just ranking them for that, etc. Very few people consider the experience of these websites compared to like the experience of small sites, especially on mobile. Again, especially on mobile where doom scrolling a 5,000 word page where nothing is hidden and, and it's difficult to find the information. Uh, it's, it's like, it's horrible. Uh, and so uh, my opinion, especially as Google is putting mobile first now, is that this is a key differentiator between the small sites and the big sites. The big sites, they hire full-time devs, they work on the experience, they, they keep customizing the way the page looks, and they still have all that SEO content at the bottom of the page, by the way, like you can find all of that. But the first half of the page is 100% focused on engagement, feeling like an app, and a design system. So I think, the way you guys need to think about this this year is build page templates, but also build elements that you can reuse and hide some of your content. I know it sounds counterintuitive because hiding content historically has been correlated with bad rankings, but now if you do it with CSS rules and you do, don't do like some dodgy JavaScript, et cetera, that's harder to crawl, it's completely fine to do that. You can see all the large sites doing that and a user engagement basically matters more now than just having some hidden content. And, and I see Google has shown that in the antitrust trial, like they've basically said, we don't understand content very well, but we look at how the users interact with it. And so if you can drive this engagement up by making a bit better UX through templates and through potentially hiring designers, by the way, like it's pretty difficult to do yourself. Um, that's going to 
in my opinion, make a big difference. And that's definitely something that we're looking at introducing even more next year. And you'll be able to see it firsthand on Atari Hacker this year. I hope we're done with that project. Uh, but when that's done, it's like you'll be able to see the demo of that, basically. Um, so anything else to say on, on UX and design? Uh, no, nothing on UX. But I think now is a good time to introduce today's podcast sponsor, which is Search Intelligence, the digital PR agency, which helps you build links. What a crazy campaign. How to sleep on your back. This campaign got us links in Huffington Post, Glamour Magazine, Mirror, and lots of other great news publications. Let me show you how we've done it. It was so simple. Our sleep client provided us with expert commentary about how to train yourself to fall asleep on your back. They also gave advice on why it's best to sleep on your back. Once we fed this information, we went to Muckrack and searched for journalists that consistently write about sleep and well-being. We've sent these journalists the advice provided by the client and within one day the links started flowing in. Glamour Magazine, a DR81 website, picked it up. Huffington Post, DR88, Mirror UK, DR90, a massive avalanche of links blasted through our client's website with this simple yet effective campaign about how to sleep on your back. I hope this inspires and I hope you'll use this technique to land massive links to your or your client's website. Thanks again to Search Intelligence for sponsoring this episode. And now I think we need to talk about word count because Ooh, it, it kind of goes back into what you're talking about UX before, right? You know, it's a bad experience when you have 6,000 word article on your phone, plus the, the screen's like com compressed. Like Exactly. People have notoriously short attention spans and every study that they do year after year, people's attention spans are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So why people imagine, you know, that everybody is reading their 6,000 word article on their small phone screen, it's just not happening. More and more people are scanning through the content and just looking for the bits of information that they want or even using, you know, AI to digest articles and summarize it and yeah. things like that these days as, as well. So all that's to say that I think this notion of we can outrank our competitors if we make a more comprehensive, longer, more complete article that was true back when everyone else was doing 300 or 400 word articles. But now that everybody is doing very long articles, I think the game is actually going the other way. And conciseness, yeah. time to value, getting to the point and delivering value quickly when in a limited amount of time is, is becoming crucial. And that's how we're going to be focusing our content this year. I mean, on page.ai did that kind of like study of like before and after HCU. And they found that Content, the content that ranks now is shorter, actually. Like it's finally Google is like turning around and starting to rank shorter content. So it's really about, and that's the thing, it's like it's going to be about passing that information in fewer words. People, people are watching TikToks, like, and, and even then they barely finish the one the 30 seconds or one minute videos or something. Like it's that's how little attention you have for people. And that's why the UX is important, but also the conciseness. Like the laziest way to create content is to type words. Like these days is the least amount of work. Like you don't need to shoot a video, et cetera, it's to type words. It's also one of the slowest and most, most demanding way for you to absorb information in terms of attention on the internet. Like people could go elsewhere and get that information in a either easier way to consume. So like shorts, for example, or like something that demands less attention. And so it's something that's very difficult to do with freelance writers, especially because they get they often get paid per word, etc. And they kind of like have always written SEO content and so on. But that's something we're pushing very, very, very hard on into our editorial, which is like, can you say this with less word? Can you say this with less word? Like last week again, uh, we had a, uh, we had a call with the editor, and I just took chunks of the article and I literally rewarded like two paragraphs in one sentence and like essentially said the same information. And that's and that's something that honestly is most likely to be rewarded in an AI world eventually, mixing short information with high information density and firsthand experience slash uh, human experience because Google wants that human content basically. And no more walls of text together. So like, you know, the formatting, et cetera, like that's, that's something that we're changing. And we're, that's why also I'm starting to not want to use on-page tools anymore because on-page tools tend to recommend high word count because they focus on on you know search intent and the pages that are ranking etc but google tends to rank less and less of similar pages for a lot of queries like they, it's like we're looking to potentially start using less on-page tools or even no on-page tool 
this year, uh, based on like, we need to do some more internal tests on like, we, we are written, writing some articles with on page tools, some articles without, we kind of monitoring performance, et cetera. And if it makes no difference, or if potentially the shorter articles do better, then we're gonna drop them all together uh, and just focus on making short, useful content instead. I think a big part of the problem here is that writers will create everything in the Google Doc and kind of like not see the end output. So, you know, they're they're on their desktop, on their laptop, they're they're reading this this article. And it makes sense, it reads well on the on the doc. When you put it onto the the, the page, all your UX elements are, are there and stuff, and then you open it on your phone and then you read it. It's like actually this is this is quite a pain to to read. So I would suggest that like you and your team just every so often start using your phone to browse your own site. Because I know very few people uh, spend spend time doing that, and you'll see that uh, the your content is often not that easy to read for the the types of people that are are just really want to scan through it and not read every every single word. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I don't want to say much more on word count. Just like we are going away from you know whatever is recommended for the query, basically. And and again, this goes together with templates. Templates is really a big pillar this year for us. Uh, another thing we're changing uh, in terms of pillar is how we're reviewing products. So obviously, review content still a pretty good money maker when you're ranking for these queries. Uh, and one thing that we're changing is is the method, the methodology that of doing reviews. And that is also, I mean, we knew about this before, but it's also heavily inspired by the success of NapLab, basically, which uh, talking to Derek and seeing how he does his uh, quantitative scoring for mattresses and his review process and how it's built, it really inspired us to like update everything we produce in terms of review content to follow a similar process. Uh, that's actually a process that we have already updated the AutoSI system for this year. So we actually built a whole new system on how to build your own quantitative scoring system. And we've built full page templates in generate blocks. So you actually can display this visually and do all the UX formatting templates, et cetera, that we just talked about. Uh, literally one click import, you can customize it. It's just generate press. You can even use the free version of generate press. It works. So it's a, it's a pretty cool system. It's a system we're using internally as well for our review content right now. Uh, and it makes sense, basically. All of this comes from Google's re review guidelines. They, uh, a year and a bit ago, they, they had the, the Google review update and they've had a couple since then. I think it's part of the core algorithm now, but uh, in the guidelines, they say that you need to have quantitative and qualitative scoring for each like sub element or sub part um, of a product you're you're reviewing, so you know a cell phone, you know battery life, um, you know performance, uh, connectivity, like these these types of things that that might might matter. So whatever it is you're reviewing, you need to break it down into these subcategories and then figure out a smart way to apply a quantitative scoring. In some cases, it's just like oh, I think it's a three out of five. But in the case of you know NapLab as a good example, or the Hoops Geek as, a, as an awesome example of how, how they do this as well. They, they review a lot of basketball shoes uh, and they, they break down the different elements of what's important in a, bra in a basketball shoe, you know, like stability, um, comfort, look, various other things. And they don't even have the, all of the, the shoes um, in their lab in the, in the same way that, that NapLab uh, had all the mattresses. Instead, what they do is they look at what other people have reviewed on YouTube, um, the, the the shoes, and then they assign uh, scoring based on their own criteria to each each um, aspect of of the shoe based on each uh, video that they're they're looking at. So they may have five videos, and they'll get a you know comfort scoring of four point two because you know some of them were fives, a few fours in there, and one three based on other other people's content. So there's a way to kind of formulate the, these scores almost like crowdsource it in a, in a way without having to acquire the product, which I think is really, really interesting. Yeah, that's the thing. It shows that you don't necessarily need first-hand. I mean, it's better to have first-hand experience and it's being rewarded in other ways by Google through the EAT systems, et cetera. However, uh, you can see how this site, the Hoops Geek, manages to still apply this system of reviewing, which Google encourages, but also it just makes the reviews more engaging. Like it just, you want to see how well the product scores on each score, except on each criteria. And so you just check the whole review at least. Uh, and so that that shows that you don't need first-hand experience to actually apply this system, which which applies to a lot more people. So, so that's something that we're playing in our business and we've released all the templates already in TAS. So if you are in TAS, just go and check the Facebook group. You'll see all the updates, the links to the lessons, 
and the templates that you can import directly to your site so you don't even have to build anything. And if you're not in task, go to authorityhacker.com forward slash system because of course we have our new year discount offer running throughout this week. So go check that out now as well. Another thing that I want to talk about is cross-platform opportunity, right? So it's like, obviously with all the shakiness Google has experienced recently, a lot more people have been looking outside of Google to drive traffic to their business slash site. And the thing as well is with the rise of EEAT and the need to become a more legitimate business in the way you create content, et cetera, you know, if you start doing like hands-on content, et cetera, there's a bit of a missed opportunity to not, for example, make a YouTube video when you review a product or even like social stories, et cetera, because essentially you're already doing all the work. The hardest part is to actually, you know, get the product in hand, create the content, create the, the insights, et cetera. And if you're doing that, shooting a video is not that difficult. Like you can even do that with your phone, basically. Uh, and so that's something that we're looking at into our projects this year. It's like, Google is still going to be probably the main traffic source for most project projects. However, we are going to be mixing in, we're doing, I mean, we're doing YouTube, for example, here, but we're going to be mixing in other traffic sources such as like Pinterest. Uh, we've done a top podcast with Tony Hill. Uh, Facebook, uh, it's, it's something that I really honestly didn't believe in initially. Uh, like Facebook pages, I was like, that's a bit weird. But honestly, I'm seeing more and more positive results from people doing this. So it's like, I'm, I'm slowly changing my mind on that. Actually, Anne Moss did a newsletter recently where she shared the RPM per traffic source. And her RPM from Google was $48 per thousand visits. Her RPM from her Facebook page was $67 per thousand visits, which is, you know, 40% more than Google. And the RPM from Pinterest was $77 per visit, per thousand visits, sorry, which is 60% more than Google. So it's like, even though these sources drive less traffic for the ad revenue uh, stuff, at least it generates significantly higher income. So you don't necessarily need as many visitors to make the same amount of money. So it's like definitely something that we're looking into uh, generating right now. And we actually have some uh, people in pro and test that actually do that, right? It's like there's, for example, uh, Simple Germany. They are a test student. Uh, they are helping foreigners, you know, settle in Germany, basically. It's a cool site. But they also have a pretty successful YouTube channel, actually, and they're doing very well there. Uh, they're tackling the same topics as their website. They're embedding the videos on their site, so you kind of like ping pongs from each other. And they are getting, they have like 50,000 subscribers. They're getting like tens of thousands of views to their best videos, even recent videos. And so it's a really good way for them to generate traffic to their site. They have services as well. And, uh, and it works very well for them, basically. Another great example of, of how that can be very effective and also, you know, just plain up, straight up help your SEO is uh, Money to the Masses. It's a personal finance site here in the UK. And they compete against, you know, like big, big sites on uh, a lot of personal finance queries, which, you know, as you know, are very, very competitive. And one thing that they do is that every month they update their, you know, best credit cards for so-and-so, su such and such criteria, uh, videos. Uh, so they'll have one, you know, January, 2024. And oh, sometimes it's exactly the same video as, as before, just, you know, they've, they've mentioned the different date. Uh, sometimes, you know, one or two of the features of a credit card or the offers will, will, will change, but they always have a up-to-date, up-to-the-month date video on their their page and they're a dr55 site competing against you know the dr90 sites out there against against these terms and they're beating them in many cases so really simple example um how you can create you know low effort low friction videos and use it to to help your seo yeah one thing as well with developing these other traffic sources is that it actually grows your branded traffic right so when people find you on youtube or when they find you on facebook pinterest whatever pinterest maybe a bit less because you can click directly to the site but these other channels where there's no like direct linking very or like very obvious linking then it will grow your branded traffic and one thing that we've seen with the recent google updates is that the higher your branded traffic, the less likely you are to be shaking with these updates. Like it's not always the case. You will find a couple of counter examples, et cetera. But very often when you put the name of the site in the Keyword Explorer or whatever keyword tool you're using, and you see a fair amount of branded traffic, like in several hundreds, at least, you know, uh, then you will tend to see the sites maybe move with the updates, but not nearly as much, right? Like maybe they took a 20% a hit, but they didn't take an 80% hit or something like that. And that's because when people search for your brand and Google doesn't return your website, Google is a bad search engine basically. And so they can't kill 
branded like sites with lots of searches as heavily as they would a site that nobody searches for. And the thing is, like a lot of people are trying to game that. You know, they go on micro walkers and then try to do that. My opinion is like it might work now, but if this becomes widespread, uh, eventually Google is just gonna use your Google account history to see how legit your your account is. You know, and so like if you're just someone that's just Google's like a million randomly unrelated brands forever, all day, every day then they're just going to discount these searches and just count the searches from the people who actively use Gmail, actively use Google Calendar, uh, have a YouTube watch history and all like maybe an Android uh, phone that they can track as well. And then they'll be able to discount these shitty accounts. I haven't tested now. Maybe it works actually if you use micro workers. But yeah, branded search through cross-platform is really good. And you can make good money. Like I am showed that uh, Coffiness makes a lot of money as well. Uh, who, they are like a pro student that reviews coffee machine and they have a really big YouTube channel. So like, yeah, lots of examples. Obviously having an email list as well is a really good idea when you're trying to grow other channels. The reason why is because you can drive traffic to that. So for example, this podcast, you're probably watching it because we emailed you the link to YouTube, right? And so when we got started with YouTube, it was a really simple way for us to get to a couple thousand subscribers and start getting some distribution on the platform itself. Now, most of the views come from YouTube itself because a lot of you have watched our videos in the past and YouTube recommends it, but you're helping the platforms by sending traffic early to identify who your audience is so that they can promote your content to them. And eventually you get some organic reach and these platforms do the work for you basically. So overall, Google still the goat, I think, honestly, like doesn't matter all these updates, etc. by far still the goat in terms of like getting traffic passively every single day without having to do anything, social posts, etc. It's quite nice. But I think YouTube comes closer second than it was last year now. And then these other platforms, they also in a way can help your SEOs through this brand search and through in general, just looking more legit in the eyes of people, which helps increasing conversions. And since you're doing you know, more and more legit work with your content anyway, you might as well do this stuff. So that's the thing. Now let's talk about what people care about a lot on this podcast and that's links. So I, I propose we do a bit of a different format here. We're gonna go through different types of links. And since Mark, you are a link building in the company, you just tell us what our policy is this year for this type of link, right? Okay. So let's just start with uh, the one that many people use right now, guest posting. Uh, for, so for Authority Hacker, we do no guest posting, no active guest posting uh, at, at the moment. The reason for that is because we're DR78 and it rarely moves a needle. You just can't get the number of links or the, the high enough DR links to, to kind of move the scale for, for us. However, when we're starting new sites, that is one of the first things we're, we're going to be doing because there's always, always uh, a number of good relevant sites that you can get uh, link that you can get guest posts from. Some of them might be paid. We're open to doing that. Uh, we pay for very, very, very few links these days on, on Authority Hacker. But I understand that that's because, you know, we have a, a reach and an audience and stuff already. Uh, when you're starting out, you generally have to pay for um, links until you get get off the ground with with these types of types of guest posts. So it's something we're we're planning on doing. However, uh, there's a big problem with paid links in general, and that's that there are a lot of some guest post farms out there. Is what, what we call them, so sites that exist purely to sell you a link. And we want to avoid these completely. So we almost like don't care so much about whether it's a DR30 or a 40 or a 60 site when we're a new site. Uh, we want all of those links if they are real sites and if they are somewhat relevant to us. It doesn't have to be the exact same niche, but somewhat adjacent or somewhat uh, similar that they could realistically be, be linking to us. So those are really the only two criteria um, for, for guest posts these days that, that, that matter. Yeah, yeah, it feels like when you like, there's always like 50 to 100 links that are like fairly relevant, not completely shit when you get started. But the problem is like when you try to scale it up, eventually you run out of these decent ones and you kind of like start compromising. Exactly. And that's when, that's when stuff hit, like shit hits the pan. And it's like, that's when you stop. Like that's, that's pretty much how it was. It does have quite a lot at the beginning though. How about Haro? Haro is getting paid in 2020. So right? it's not, I, I don't know the exact details of when they're doing this yet, but it, it sounds like they want to add uh, some kind of minimal subscription. I'm imagining like 20 bucks a month or something um, to, to, to this. The problem they've had last year is that everybody's just spamming every Haro query with AI answers and they're all yeah. shit. <laughs> Um, because most most of the time, people who are doing Harold want 
personal experience or a, a story from an, an expert to, to share in their, their article. And AI can't do that or it's, it's kind of faking it. Uh, so it's be become a real problem. I think it's a big opportunity because it means that there's a lot of the kind of spammers are not going to bother doing that anymore. So your chance of being accepted is, is higher. Um, I think Haro is something that every site should do. It's not something that you can scale. You just do do what you can with the queries that come in. And some days you'll you'll get one or two. Other days there there might be nothing, depending on what what space you're in. Um, so just keep an eye on it and um, and and yeah, run it every day and and answer the queries um, as as best you can. This is another example of you know what we talked about earlier, partnering with someone who's a true expert in in the field. You can have them answer the Harrow queries in a very authentic way, and they'll they'll because they're an expert, they'll be able to get the top placements on the top publications there. So yeah, good way to get links. We've had some, you know, dr ninety plus links through to Harrow. It can be a bit hit or miss sometimes, uh, and I, again, the the chance of being su um, successful has gotten lower as more people are, are using it. But I'm I'm hopeful that this uh, this pricing uh, change will yeah, it's will good actually. Better. Are we doing paid links? Are we not doing paid links? It's a little bit confused right now. Yeah, so on Authority Hacker, it's been quite a while since we've done any paid links at, at, at all. Again, the reason is because the types of sites that want money, uh, they're not off usually the types of sites that we want links from, right? And whenever there's a kind of value exchange, it, it often ends up being a kind of link exchange or three-way link exchange. So we still do you know, some of those, but it's really not a core part of our, our strategy anymore at, at Authority Hacker. I do recognize though, that when you're starting a new site, you need to, you're gonna almost certainly have to do some paid links in the in the beginning. And there are many good ones out there. So in the past, I know we've been very against paid links and we've kind of like went really for paid links. I'm still kind of against them. They're not great, but I accept that it's just something you, you have to do from time to time. And you should shy away from it the a new site. Yeah, it's like it's 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 not ideal. It's like it's it, my problem with paid links is you end up in bad company. You know, like you end up with the people that you don't want to be with. Well, uh, so it's what you're saying before about like you, you can do a few and it's fine, but then if you yeah. as soon as you try and scale it, like there's there's not that many sites that are good sites, real sites that are willing to sell you links. So you run out of them, and then you know when you're trying to build. 50 links a month with this very quickly you're going to start hitting the link farms and, and and all that it's just just somewhere you don't want to be so it's very similar to alcohol basically like if you do a little bit it's fine but you, it's a you slippery slope and... yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay well so like you know buy links like you buy alcohol um <laughs> next is a uh, digital pr the digital pr is great uh so we have been at the end of last year uh we ran our first internal campaign and really starting to see some results with that. Uh, We've done some five or six before and they, they were, we got a few links, but they weren't clicking. We're, we're just finally starting to catch on to like what, what's working. I'm hoping actually, um, I'm not sure this year, I'm hoping to bring out some uh, more detailed training about how that works for you know digital PR for link building um, at some point as well. Um, I think we just need a little bit more experience in that. Um, before before we do it, but it's great. You know, you you can create a piece of content, um, sending it out to top journalists, and you're getting publications that you would never in a million years get from, uh, you know, like your guest posting or skyscraper campaigns or or whatever. So this is something which everyone who's serious should be doing, and it's also quite easy to do for new sites, right? Because it's the the weight of the story is generally what carries the success of the campaign more so than your site, right? So you don't need authority to, and you don't need to be able to rank anything or you don't need to be able to offer anyone an exchange or anything like that in order to, to get links this way. So, you know, it's obviously expensive um, to run a campaign um, if, if you're- How much does it cost if we do it internally? Like, do you, do you have any idea? Cause now we're starting to- well, uh, I don't know is this the short answer, but you know, it's usually, several thousand dollars. I mean, it really depends on how you're getting the data for your story. Sometimes that can be cheap or free, but more often than not, you need to pay for like survey participants and to collect data and, and things like that. So yeah, I'm sure you could do it for less than a thousand dollars if you really, really, really budgeted it. But, you know, expect to spend a few thousand for, for, for that if you're, if you're doing it internally and a little bit more, I think if you, if you go to uh, an agency like, you know, search intelligence or something. Yeah, okay. Uh, and how about linkable assets? 
Uh, so the, for us at Authority Hacker, this is basically all we're doing for, for link building um, these days. You know, survey posts, statistics posts, data studies, uh, these these types of things because, yeah, they build you links passively over time because people will, will link to you, will link to these these posts. The problem is uh, you need to, like, so we, we, we rank for number one for AI statistics, above Forbes, by the way. Uh, and the problem with that is that uh, you need to you need to have a decent amount of authority. I think we're one of the lowest authority sites on page one for yeah. uh, for AI statistics. We're DR seventy eight, uh, so that gives gives you an idea. If we were DR thirty, we wouldn't be there. It doesn't matter how good our, our data is. That's just a reality of the market. Uh, so you need to you need to have that authority in order to rank content, in order to build build those those kind of passive links through linkable assets. If we're starting that for if we're doing that for a new site, I would still be thinking about that, but looking at on a less competitive uh, spaces. So you know we wouldn't go after AI, but we might go after you know we we also did one on link building, so like a link building statistics. And while the competition's higher, there's more sort of DR fifty and sixty sites in there. So for a new site, brand new site, we're probably not going to do this in the first six to twelve months. But it's something we would really, really, really be uh, aiming to get into maybe after the the kind of like nine to twelve month uh, mark. Yeah. One thing as well is like for the statistics pages to get them started, I, I actually bought ads to them. So actually like before we ranked, uh, it's like I we haven't worked out the ROI at this point. But like I think if we start new projects, we definitely like, you know, if you want to rank for these kind of queries, like it might be worth it. Like, you know, it's like I'm always considering like, you know, how much do people pay for link building agencies to build a link? And then it's like, can I match that by just building pages and then having ads pointing at, at these pages for like very highly linkable keywords, basically. And so like that's an experiment that I, we might even make a video about that if we actually make it or something because it's quite interesting to explore the ROI of that. There's two elements to that, right? So there's the, does the fact that you're running PPC influence some engagement metrics, yeah. user metrics, and does that help you rank? Or it's like, does just being there, do our writers and journalists clicking on your statistics post first and then linking to you Linking to read and so, then you rank, yeah, exactly. So there's just sort of two questions to answer there, but it'd be interesting to test that on a, a new site. But you can kind of like fake it to make it for these kind of linkable assets, basically. Where it's like, it's, the question is like, is it worth the money? That's really the big question, but like you can absolutely do that. And I got all these pages started that way. Like I, I did a campaign for most of these pages and they're all ranking number one now. Um, but we also did other things to these pages, you know? My hunch is, and I, I have no data to back this up, my hunch is um, I probably wouldn't want to do that till we're sort of like DR35, 40, like pushing that kind of realm. Yeah, depends, depends. It's like, I, in my opinion, it's like, it's probably worth investing a little bit, see how the page fares, because I think for every topic it's going to be different. And provided this generates enough links, like you might be like, well, maybe this costs me like $800 a month, but I generate like, 12 great links per month, it might be worth the price to me, for example, like something like that. Um, but yeah, it's like, so that's the kind of stuff like we have had success with it. We want to explore more and we will apply to new projects this year. So it's going to be quite interesting to explore. If you want to make sure that you don't miss these other things that we explore, make sure you subscribe to this podcast because we talk about essentially how we do things, etc. If you want even more, you can actually go and check out the cell we're running right now on the Atari site system on the slash system. It's only running for the next few days. So just hurry up because after that, the price is going back up. I hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you guys in the next one. Bye. All right, I hope you enjoyed this episode and that your mind is bubbling with a bunch of ideas on how to adapt your business for 2024. I just wanted to quickly remind you that we are now running a special on the authority site system that includes our brand new content templates that you can one click import to your site. They're fully designed, they're mobile responsive, and they won't slow down your site because they're built on Generate Press. They're templates that match exactly the kind of content that's winning in the subs right now after HCU. And they come on top of 12 brand new lessons that we've added to the course that address a bunch of changes in AI and in how Google works right now. And we're running a new year special where you can get the course for the lowest amount you'll ever pay for it. So get all the information on atarihacker.com system. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I'll see you in the next one.